president of anas doctor professor bhavanta gamage i would like to introduce the speaker today and i would like to welcome you all for this uh, important webinar a series of webinar organized by the slamat and today topic is uh, laparoscopic adrenalectomy and done by um, uh, dr sudesh samraji i don't think he needs a uh, introduction to the uh, the committee surgical committee in sri lanka he is one of the uh, young surgeons who is a uh, really enthusiastic in minimal access surgery and doing a marvelous service in the country in different parts of the country at present he is working as the uh, consultant general surgeon in uh, trincomalee and uh, he's a he has a brilliant academic career as well as surgical career as we are quite uh, behind the schedule without any further delay i would like to in the, uh, uh, invite dr uday samarji to start the webinar thank you very much Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we Thank can you, hear you there. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rasil Manatunga, uh, for introducing me uh, and welcome to the, uh, I think this is a seventh webinar conducted by uh, the uh, SLAMANTS, Sri Lankan Association of uh, Minimal Invasive and uh, Digital Surgeons. So in collaboration with the College of Surgeons and also greeting from uh, the Eastern province, Trincomalee, the Naval City. So let us start the uh, presentation. I'll share my screen. So today the, we are going to discuss about uh, laparoscopic adrenalectomy. And uh, uh, before going to the main uh, presentation, I would like to give you the overview. Uh, first, we look into the history of adrenal surgery a little bit, and then the current Sri Lankan literature. I hope uh, most of the juniors who have joined today uh, probably would not uh, know about the current Sri Lankan literature and, and the history of adrenal surgery in our country. And a little bit of applied anatomy, especially for the surgeons, and then the indications and contraindications for the minimal invasive adrenalectomy. And then what are the approaches to adrenal in, uh, from, in the minimal invasive technique? And also how to prepare a patient, especially the pre pre preparation of a patient with uh, 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 functional adrenal tumors, really important, especially if you have chromocytomas. And also uh, then we will talk about the practical aspects, especially the OT setup, the positioning of the patient, the procedure itself, and also a few words about complications. Uh, Procedure actually I have selected two edited master videos because we can't uh, uh, show you an entire length of the surgery which will take about hours, but we have, I have uh, uh, managed to get the key steps of the surgery so that you can understand the key steps. Okay, so uh, the first description of the adrenal gland was by a, Italian anatomist called Bartholomew Eustatius, and that was in 1552. However, uh, after identifying the organ, but the, that time people didn't know what it was doing, so the physiology. So it took at least another 300 years to uh, identify the function of these glands. So that was done by uh, the famous Thomas Edison. Uh, in 1897, John Abel from USA uh, extracted a name epinephrine from the medulla. And also in 1912, uh, the famous Cushing's, Harvey Cushing's, again from USA, described the eponymous uh, Cushing syndrome. Uh, in 1955, uh, Jerome Conn reported the first patient with primary hyperaldosteronism. So this is the, the, the evolution of the adrenal physiology and the anatomy. And uh, uh, so we'll go and uh, the first planned adrenalectomy was carried out by a British surgeon called uh, Sir William uh, Perry Sargent. However, I could not find a picture of him actually, uh, but that was in 1914. But the first laparoscopic adrenalectomy was done by in, in 1992 
nearly about 90 years backward after by an American surgeon who was based in New York at that time called Michel Gagner. So Michel and his uh, colleagues, uh, sorry. Michel and, and his colleagues after an, uh, in, uh, the first one was performed in 1992, but in 1993, he presented his work uh, in an annual meeting of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. Uh, and that the paper was, uh, this, is a, this is a headline of the paper, the early experience with laparoscopic approach for adrenalectin. So he was a person who introduced this uh, procedure and the, the first surgery was actually a laparoscopic transabdominal surgery, which is actually the most easiest way to learn, easiest technique to learn. And also if you are planning to start on adrenalectomies, I, I would advise to uh, study on laparoscopic transabdominal approach, which, which is easier rather than the other approaches which we will see, which we will see in, in the later part of the presentation. Now, this is a person who did the first adrenalectomy in our country. I mean, most, some of you may know and others might not know. It's doc, done by Dr. Sarath Kumar Kohli in 2004. And that was in, uh, in the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. And that's again a transabdominal approach. So I was, I, as a senior registrar and a registrar to him, uh, at that time, we collected all the data that we, uh, the, of the adrenalectomies performed in our unit at that time. And then we presented the first paper as a free paper in the 2010 uh, annual academic sessions. So the, which was authored by myself. And at that time, my registrar was, uh, our registrar was Dr. Nirosh, Nirosh Natulukam, who is now currently an oncosurgeon in uh, the provincial uh, general hospital, Badunda. So at that time, uh, uh, we were actually busy in, uh, and we were actually involved in preparing the patients with pheochromocytomas and all these functional tumors. And uh, we actually helped and uh, assisted for these procedures to our uh, consultant. So, the, and the, uh, if I go, if I present to you some, uh, some of the, the, the summary of the, the first paper, actually we, uh, the unit, uh, from October 2006 to April 2010, uh, number of surgeries attempted was actually 20, and number completed laparoscopy was 17. Uh, so three we had to open due to uh, various uh, reasons. The mean operative time was about 95 to 180 minutes, and the largest tumor diameter, which was resected laparoscopically, was 6.5 centimeters. And the mean post-operative stay was about three days. And the blood loss ranged from 50 to 350 ml. And this is a summary of the first paper. And uh, so after that, uh, several reports and case reports and brief reports came out from Sri Lankan surgeons and uh, two reports from our current president, Dr. Bhavanta Gamage. And actually I would uh, ask you to read this because these are really important. Uh, the first one was actually about uh, the three dimensional laparoscopy, the 3D laparoscopy, the maiden experience during an adrenal surgery in Sri Lanka, uh, which was done actually in uh, Kalam South Teaching Hospital, Kalabovil. And the second one is important article, uh, the vital steps in successful laparoscopic adrenalectomy identify the adrenal vein because uh, Later part, later in the presentation, we will see that managing the adrenal vein is a key step in the surgery, especially in the functional tumor, especially in a pheochromocytoma. And managing the right adrenal vein is actually sometimes challenging. So this article just gives you some, uh, some of the key steps and uh, some important points to uh, consider, especially uh, during adrenal surgery to identify the adrenal vein. The, uh, both of both these articles were published in the Sri Lankan Journal of Surgery, first one in 2017 and the second one in 2018. And there was another uh, literature article from uh, uh, Professor Kibi Galket here uh, about, it was actually a case report, laparoscopic bilateral adrenalectomy in a young female patient uh, with recurrent Cushing's disease. 
And this was published in the uh, case reports in endocrinology in 2021. Uh, I'm not going to discuss detail anatomy, but I, what, what I would like to highlight is that the adrenals are actually in the posterior in, in relation to the, in the retroperitoneum in relation to the posterior abdominal wall. What is more important is the, the blood supply. Now, if you look into the right adrenal, it has a very short straight vein entering directly into the IVC. But there are some variations which we need to know, which I will describe in the latter slide. And also, you know, the adrenal has three blood supplies from the uh, inferior phrenic, a direct branch from the abdominal aorta, and also another branch from the, the renal arteries. So what is more important is to know the, that the, uh, to approach these things and how to approach, we will see later part in the video. Now, these are the variations, anatomical variations of right adrenal vein. I specifically selected the right adrenal because it's a bit challenging sometimes, especially in a large tumor to approach the vein. So the normal vein, as you know, the right adrenal, sometimes it's very closely related to the IVC and sometimes part of it can be actually even behind the, uh, the IVC. The normal vein is a short, very uh, short straight vein to that, uh, the IVC, but there are variations and this is one of the variation. The adrenal vein can directly vein, uh, drain into the confluence of the right renal and the IVC or it can even drain sometimes to the uh, straightly to the right renal vein. And uh, other less common variations are the, the right renal, the right adrenal vein draining into the uh, high, in a higher position to the IVC, or it could even drain into the confluence of the hepatic and the IVC confluence. So these are some of the variations which you need to keep in mind, especially when you are uh, planning to embark on adrenal surgery. A few words about uh, uh, incidental lomas before going into the practical things, because uh, this is something which we need to keep in mind. Nowadays, uh, because we do a lot of imaging for other, other abdominal symptoms, other abdominal problems, and we can come, uh, come across incidentally detected adrenal lesions. So you need to know a few uh, concepts about uh, incidental lomas and uh, uh, how to manage them. Now, if you take uh, the people at the age of 50 years, there's a 3% chance of detecting an incidental loma in a radiological investigations. We are talking about ultrasound and CT. And out of this, uh, out of these incidental lomas, 85% of them are non-functional. So remaining 15% are functional. And then if you subcategorize them, uh, five of them, 5% 5 of them will be fear chromocytomas and other five will be uh, functioning adenomas of the adrenal. And 4% of this could be actually adrenal cortical cancer in a very early stage. And 2% can be actually from a metastatic adrenal lesions from somewhere else. Now, if you look at look into the non-functional adrenal lesions, the, that is the 85% of these. So there is a, a management dilemma. Do we need to take out all of these lesions? So how do we decide this? The decision is made on the risk of malignancy of these non-functional adenomas, because you can't identify malignancy just by looking at the CT. But size is a very good indicator of malignancy. So if you look into the data, uh, if the non-functioning non adenoma or incidental loma is less than four centimeter in size, there's a 2% chance of being an adrenal cortical cancer or a malignant lesion. If the lesion size is between four to six centimeters, the risk of malignancy is 6%. And if the lesion is more than 6%, suddenly the risk of malignancy jumps into 25%. So that is very important and very significant. The other important thing is that 90% of adrenal cortical carcinomas are larger than four centimeter 
at the time of diagnosis. And lesions which are less than four centimeter uh, are, and having a benign appearance in CT scans, we will see what is the benign appearance that we are talking about, need follow-up. So follow-up regime has to be initiated. And surgery is needed for lesions about four centimeter, even if the imaging features are benign, because I told you the risk of malignancy is 6%, and that is actually a significant number. So uh, I thought of talking to you about the adrenal protocol in CT, because now this is a very standard protocol that we use. Uh, I mean, people who are doing adrenal surgery will, will already will, or will be knowing, will know about this, but especially for the juniors who have joined today, uh, it's important to know what is this adrenal protocol and how do we decide on the, uh, the, the, the malignant appearance according to the CT. So a dedicated adrenal protocol of CT is really important and CT is a, is a very important investigation when it comes to uh, investigating adrenal lesions. Now, measuring the unhindered attenuation value of adrenal masses is important for diagnosing lipid pressure adenomas. Uh, in unhindered attenuation value of less than 10 Hounsfield unit is characteristic of a benign adrenal mass. So if you're, if you're uh, non-contrast CT, if you ask a radiologist to calculate the Hounsfield value, and if that is less than 10, then there is a very high chance that this is a, a benign adrenal lesion, especially a lipid rich adenoma. And we calculate a contrast enhancement washout. And after giving the contrast in a, in a, a specific time protocol, and then we calculate this, calculate the uh, contrast washouts. We calculate two parameters, that is the absolute contrast washout and the relative contrast washout. So the, the adrenal protocol CT, after giving the contrast, uh, we take images at 60 seconds and also then we do a delayed imaging at 15 minutes to calculate the contrast washouts. So if you look into this image carefully, the first picture is actually unenhanced, that is a without contrast. And you can see, if you look carefully, there is a lesion in the left adrenal here, right? And if you uh, look into the other page, other uh, image, now this is a right adrenal lesion. And without contrast in the uh, non-contrast CT, there is a 24 Hounsfield value. So that is significant because it's more than 10. And then, in 60 seconds venous phase, you can see the contrast value is 88 towns wheel, and in 15 minutes, it's 49. So, so we can, uh, using these values and this timing, we calculate absolute washout and relative washout. So this is how we calculate the absolute and the relative washouts. These are really important. And then, uh, we, we calculate the washouts in percentages. And these values are really important for our decision making. So unhindered attenuation value of less than 10 is characteristic of a lipid rich adenoma. That, that is figure one. And then the threshold value of more than 60% for absolute and more than 40% for relative enhancement washout have been found to be 98% sensitive and 92% specific for diagnosing adrenal adenomas. So this is really important. Uh, I think you need a, a dedicated uh, radiologist, especially when you are making the decision who, uh, who is having enough experience in adrenal pathologies and then reporting this. And also, especially if you are embarking on adrenal surgery, it's better to have a multidisciplinary team with an endocrinologist, a radiologist, and a dedicated uh, team. So this is just to see, uh, just to summarize the workout. Uh, if you can just remember this algorithm, I've just described a uh, few of these pathways. So uh, 
So you, uh, first thing is to rule out whether, they are, whether the lesion is actually a functioning tumor or a non-functioning tumor. If it is a functioning tumor after the hormonal evaluation, then you need to get your endocrinologist's opinion and manage the patient accordingly. Now, they, they may also need surgery at some stage. If there are no biochemical abnormality, if they are non-functional, and if you don't have prior imaging, then if the person is having a history of a malignancy previously, you need to keep in mind that this may be a, a secondary deposit in the adrenal. So if there's no previous history of malignancy in a person who is previously uh, healthy and well, then you need to do the adrenal protocol CT and then decide on management. So if the CT, uh, CT densitometry shows the Hounsville value of more than 10, that is significant. And then we need to uh, get the, see, the adrenal washouts. And that is shown here. So if it is less than 10, you know generally it is a benign condition, benign adenoma. So if it is a benign adenoma, then you have to take a decision depending on the size. Because if the size is more than four centimeter, even the CT appearance is benign, surgery is indicated. If, this, if the benign, if the, in the benign adenoma, if the, if the, if the CT appearance is also, the CT appearance is benign and the size is less than four, then you need to do serial imaging on a follow-up with a follow-up protocol. In the follow-up protocol, if the lesion is stable, uh, you, do, you don't need to take them to immediate surgery. You can actually wait a little bit and do further follow-up. But if the lesion is getting bigger on serial imaging, then we need to suspect whether there are is a malignancy risk and you need to offer surgery for them. So if the, in, uh, if the hounds will have is more than 10, and if you do a contrast washout and calculate the absolute and the relative uh, contrast washouts, and if the washouts are more than 60 and 40%, then the lesions are suspicious. Then you may need further imaging or you may consider doing surgery, right? So if you can remember this protocol, it's really important. And this is actually uh, how we decide on management uh, for adrenal lesions, depending on the CT and the size. A few words I thought of talking about, few words of uh, managing uh, fear chromocytoma patients, because as surgeons, you should know when your patient is ready to uh, take them to theater. Uh, the main problem of fear chromocytoma is, is actually the excess production of uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. So uh, a few words about diagnostic tests. Uh, these are the diagnostic tests we use uh, with their relative uh, sensitivities and specificities. Nowadays, the, uh, the most important test to diagnose a chromocytoma is actually the plasma metanephrines with a very high sensitivity and specificity. Earlier days, we used VMA but now VMA is used basically as a screening uh, investigation rather than a diagnostic investigation. So uh, the most important factor that has drastically reduced the perioperative morbidity and mortality is the meticulous preoperative preparation. Because as you know, if you take a pa patient for surgery without proper uh, preparation, you will, uh, you will have probably you'll get problems interoperatively as also postoperatively, and then acidic will find very difficult to control the blood pressure uh, during the interoperative period. And optimization encompasses negation of alpha one mediated vasoconstriction and beta one mediated tachycardia. We will see how we prepare the patient in next slide, few slides. Uh, Preoperative alpha blockade as well as fluid and salt intake is recommended. Now, how do we control the blood pressure? Uh, now we have a lot of drugs, but earlier, day, earlier days we had only a uh, phenoxybenzamine. And our alpha-1 uh, receptor antagonists are thus the initial choice of drugs for control of hypertension. Um, uh, there are two categories, uh, non-selective and selective. Select, non selective ones with phenoxybenzamine, which blocks both alpha 1 and alpha 2 receptors. 
and selective ones predominantly act on alpha-1 receptors. Uh, we can also use uh, calcium channel blockers and uh, beta blockers also, but, but most of the uh, endocrinologists, I think, prefer to use alpha, alpha blockers. These are the relative half-lives and the dosages. Beta blockers, uh, now we initially start alpha blockers and get, then get the blood pressure controlling with the titration of the dose. And what happens when we start alpha blockers is the vasoconstriction will be controlled and then the vascular system starts to dilate. When the vascular system starts dilating, the relative, the volume is not in a, is in a, inadequate. So as a result, the patient can get a orthostatic hypertension. So how do we manage the orthostatic hypertension? We need to give fluids and then uh, uh, we need to give salt and fluid, fluid in the form of intravenous fluid to fill up the vascular space. Because if you don't correct the uh, vascular space, there is reflex tachycardia uh, because from the, uh, from the uh, and, uh, and that reflex tachycardia is it's not very good for the heart. So you need to start beta blockers to uh, control the reflex tachycardia. And these are the drugs we use to control the beta blockers, the, the reflex tachycardia. So this is uh, about vascular volume expansion because catecholamine causes intense vasoconstriction. And once we block that, there is also orthostatic hypertension and then uh, the eyes, uh, this is counteract by giving more IV fluids, uh, crystalloids predominant basically with uh, increase in the salt intake. So once you, once you did do this preparation, uh, uh, looking into these parameters, you know that your patient is ready for surgery. So the systolic blood pressure should be less than 130. The diastolic should be uh, less than 80. Heart rate should be less than 80. And then there should be no orthostatic hypertension and the blood pressure. Uh, uh, there should be uh, no ventricular arrhythmia, so it should be less than one in five minutes. And the hematocrit should be less than 45. So if you are given enough fluid and uh, expanded the, uh, the, the blood volume, the hematocrit should fall. So you need at least a minimum of a good blood pressure control for three to five days before taking the patient to surgery. Okay, now we go into the practical aspect. How do we approach the adrenals? Of course, I will uh, omit the open part, but if you go into the laparoscopic technique or the minimal invasive technique, we have the conventional laparoscopic uh, trans transperitoneal technique. There are two techniques two approaches actually, the lateral approach and, approach and the anterior approach. And then uh, later people start doing retroperitoneal surgery, but there are certain limitations for retroperitoneal surgery. We will uh, next slide see what are the limitations for the retroperitoneal approach. Retroperitoneal also we can approach either lateral or posterior. With the, with the development of techniques, then came the single port surgery. And also now we have even robotic uh, transperitoneal or retroperitoneal adrenal surgery. So now in today's presentation, we will be actually looking at the uh, transperitoneal uh, uh, anterior approach, which is actually very easy to learn for those who are uh, planning to embark on adrenal surgery. I would uh, probably recommend to uh, start with this technique because it's easier and you have a lot of uh, working space initially to work with. So advantages of the laparoscopic method, I don't need to uh, highlight actually all of, I mean, all of you know about this, uh, the reduced wound mobility, sh short hospital stay, easy and quick return to the normal activity, reduced post-operative analgesic requirement, and uh, very magnified operative field, and the less blood loss. So the choice of the approach depends on several factors. The most important factors which de determine the, uh, the choice of the approach is actually the size and nature of the lesion. And also the patient's general characteristics and experience of the surgeon. Because I know 
when you start abdominal surgery, uh, most of you are, will probably start with the laparoscopic transabdominal technique, and then you need, uh, there will be a learning curve, and with uh, experience in performing many surgeries only, I think you will be then thinking about doing a retroperitoneal technique. So the experience of the surgeon really matters. So if you look into the, uh, the advantages and the disadvantages of the laparoscopic uh, transabdominal and retroperitoneal uh, techniques, uh, the advantages are the transabdominal techniques is re really easy to learn. The whole abdomen can be explored and can be combined with other abdominal operations. There is a larger working space and you can even do surgery for larger tumors. And it's, it's really suitable for obese patients because that is one of the uh, difficulties we, we place when we try to do retroperitoneal surgery uh, for uh, in obese patients. And conversion is much faster. If you run into a problem, then the conversion is much easier in laparoscopic transabdominal technique. Uh, retroperitoneal technique is not, uh, not necessary. The advantages are actually not necessary to mobilize other organs. Uh, you will be directly in the plane of the adrenal. And then uh, it's not affected by the other abdominal surgeries. Patients who have previous abdominal surgeries, transabdominal may be difficult because of the adhesions and the previous scars and things. And cardiovascular and respiratory problems are less common in retroperitoneal. Uh, and also, uh, uh, it's easier to uh, approach bilateral adrenals uh, in the retroperitoneal technique rather than because if you know, if you were to do a, a laparoscopic transabdominal, then you need to change the patient's position, which is actually cumbersome because uh, the risk of getting contamination of the operating fields and things. Uh, disadvantages are actually, uh, you need to mobilize the organs, which we will see in the pre uh, later master videos, and risk of injury to intraperitoneal organs, and uh, a long surgery time, and uh, need to reposition in bilateral cases, and also post-operative adhesive risk and incision hernia risk. But disadvantages of the retroperitoneal technique, uh, which is important ones are that it's not very suitable for obese patients and not suitable for large tumors. And with uh, very limited working space and also the learning curve is much longer, I assume, uh, rather than in uh, laparoscopic transabdominal technique. So what are the indications for minimal invasive uh, Minimal invasive uh, uh, adrenalectomy are the functional adrenal cortical lesions, Cushing's, aldosterone producing tumors, and also uh, the few chromocytomas, uh, the, that's adrenal medallary lesions. And then the non functional adrenal uh, masses. I, I explained to you that we need to do surgery for lesions more than four centimeters, even if the appearance is benign. And also the other benign lesions like myelolipomas and adrenal cysts and things, which are which may be symptomatic uh, even though they are benign. So contraindications are large invasive adrenal carcinomas and metastatic fear chromocytomas and untreated coagulopathy and other contraindications for general anesthesia and laparoscopy. So these are the contraindications for minimal invasive adrenal surgery. We go to patient positioning. This is actually positioning the patient for a left adrenal uh, in transabdominal technique. The patient is placed on the operative table, which is slightly flexed at the wrist in the right, right, uh, right lateral decubitus position. And is it really important for you to, uh, especially the operative surgeon, to get involved in positioning because ultimately you are the one who's going to be affected by poor positioning. And also in position, you must also take care to uh, prevent getting uh, uh, position related injuries to the patient, uh, because if we don't take steps, the patient can get post, can complain post operatively about uh, various problems, especially uh, they can get neuropraxias, uh, back pains and things. And also uh, you need to take care about the pressure, pressure areas as well. So I personally, uh, 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 do the positioning along with the, 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 the supporting staff, uh, especially when it comes to my patients. 
This is a positioning of a patient for right adrenals, uh, right adrenal gland uh, surgery. As you can see how uh, they put in the uh, belts to prevent the patients uh, moving during the surgery and also keeping uh, sandbags or uh, bean bags, whatever. Uh, so, uh, an adequate padding uh, to prevent uh, patient getting injuries. So the team placement, the primary surgeon uh, stands facing the abdominal side of the patient. The second surgeon will also be standing in the abdominal side and then uh, you need to keep the nurse on your side and also the, the second assistant come from the opposite side of the, of the patient. And it's really important uh, to, if you can have two monitors, because otherwise the second assistant will have a neck pain looking all the time the, uh, the, the primary operator's uh, uh, monitor. But I mean, most of us, we don't have two monitors the luxury in, that, uh, in our theaters. So equipment placement, I mean, uh, it's uh, basically uh, uh, explained in this uh, slide. So the anesthetic machine will be in the head end, the monitors will be here, the, the diatomy and the, the energy device will be on this side and your assistant, second assistant will be here looking at this monitor. So this is just to summarize the, the patient positioning, the surgeon, primary surgeon, the assisting surgeon and the second assistant and the anesthetist uh, and also the, the monitor placement. So we need special equipment, especially if you are embarking on adrenal surgery. If you are doing a right adrenal, you need the liver retractor. Uh, it's luxury to have a, a Nathanson's liver retractor, or if not, at least uh, Sherry's retractor, because uh, without that, it will be difficult. And then uh, a 30 degree laparoscope, and then you need a special, uh, you need other instruments like uh, bowel graspers, especially when you are mobilizing the colon. You need to hold the bowel without damaging them. And also uh, 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 an energy device. I use most of the time the ligasho, but you can use the ligasho, even the harmonic uh, for the surgery. And then the other things like the clip applicator or even uh, uh, the, the hemolock applicator, the polymer clip applicator and also the suction and the other device, other instruments. So, uh, and also I, a little bit of advice, if you are starting uh, adrenal surgery for the first time, it's really important to have someone with experience and also uh, make sure these all these instruments and the, uh, the equipment are available. Otherwise you will run into trouble in the middle of surgery. And if you have someone who has done surgery before, it's a really a, a, a valuable factor because uh, having two surgeons is a is it's really good because you can get your get his advice and you can also uh, he can work as a mentor for you and uh, uh, the sir and you will be less stressed uh, with, especially when you are doing your first few cases. So this is a, a the 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 instrument arrangement for the uh, left and right adrenals. Uh, I usually use two ten millimeter ports. Uh, and one, uh, one, ten, one uh, 10 millimeter port with the reducer and also another five millimeter port for the second assistant to retract for the use uh, for the retracting purpose. And also uh, this is the right adrenal. You can see the liver retractor here, in the camera and two working ports here. Here, this is a camera and these are the working ports. And one working port, of course, you need a, uh, you need to introduce the clip applicator or the uh, polymer clip applicator. So it has to be a ten port uh, uh, with a with a reducer, to five millimeter. So this is how you place your ports, uh, right adrenal. So uh, we will uh, consider uh, uh, the left adrenal uh, uh, surgery. Uh, but I, I have two, two video clips, both right and left, and they will consider the left adrenal first. If, you, if I summarize the key steps, uh, first step is actually uh, mobilizing the colon once you create the pneumoperitoneum, then dividing the uh, splenic, splenic ligaments because, uh, uh, and then locating and uh, clipping the adrenal vein, especially in a functional tumor, 
because you need to get the adrenal vein control uh, initially. Otherwise, once you handle the tumor, there will be releasing of catecholamines and shooting up of blood pressure. And then uh, you uh, uh, dissect the lower, lower and the medial aspect of the gland and locate the inferior adrenal artery and then the middle, ad middle adrenal artery from the aorta and then the superior adrenal artery coming from the inferior phrenics. And then uh, once you do, do the medial and the uh, 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 inferior dissection, then only you move on to the uh, posterior, superior and the posterior lateral dissection. Because you can't, you need to do the, the, the first steps and you need to take more time on dissecting the, uh, the vessels. Uh, So we will uh, uh, we will see a short video uh, showing the key steps of uh, left adrenal. Uh, this is actually a surgery for adrenal uh, uh, cyst. So I will uh, start playing the video, and this you can see once we entered. The first step is actually mobilizing the the splenic flexure, and here it's really important uh, drainage. You should identify the 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 avascular plane here. Because if you stick into that plane, there will be less blood blood loss. It is really important to keep the blood the uh, the operative field dry, especially when you are going to the adrenal. And uh, here, actually, you can see you now we are taking the splenico uh, colic ligament and uh, putting the splenic flexure down. Can appreciate the difference between the fat. The, this is the colonic fat, and you can see the difference between the. Uh, and this is actually the adrenal lesion. It's a adrenal cyst, and this is the gerotas fascia here. Renal fascia. So once you do the, once you put the colon down, uh, then you need to dissect. Uh, uh, the spleen towards the spleen, and your next step is to put the spleen, take your spleen out of from the operative field. So that is done by dissecting the splenic ligaments here. This is splenicocolic ligament here, and also then later the splenicocolic uh, phrenico, uh, splenic ligament. So this is really important step because without that you can't go into the superior side of the adrenal lesion. So still we are in the dissecting, dissecting the uh, uh, spleen out from our operating field. So if you stick into the other uh, tissue plates, you can see the, the, the blood loss is minimal. And this is the inferior adrenal artery arising from the renal artery. Now, we are using a sub to uh, mop the area. Here we are using actually a harmonic scalpel. Now this is now this is a step I told you about. Now we are dissecting the medial aspect of the gland. You can see the second assistant is actually retracting the gland upwards using an atraumatic grasper. And this is the uh, the medial adrenal artery, the middle adrenal artery. Sorry. So this is actually a non-functional lesion. So you don't need to worry about uh, finding the adrenal vein as a, in the early, new, early, early stages of your surgery. And now we are coming to locate the adrenal vein. So here you need to uh, meticulously dissect, right? Take your time and dissect. I of course use the, uh, the uh, the monopolar hook and do uh, take my time and dissect uh, strand by strand around the vein and skeletonize the vein first. So
So juniors always uh, remember, apply two clips to the proximal aspect of the way. And so now still we are dis dissecting the, uh, the medial aspect. And now we are going to actually to a little bit of the posterior. So stick to the tissue plane, really important. You can see traction and counter traction, the principles of surgery in minimal uh, in laparoscopy. You can see your left hand is uh, pushing the, uh, the lesion upwards and getting the traction and opening up the tissue planes. Tiny vessels can be actually taken over with the harmonic. You need to clip them. We have a few more minutes. Now we are actually dissecting the uh, lateral aspect. You can see lateral and this is some small vessels in the posterior you can see an artery there. So stay in the tissue plane, that is the principle. So we are using a, a custom made bag to uh, retrieve the adrenal lesion. Okay, so that's the key steps of the left adrenal. Uh, so we'll uh, look into a short video look into the uh, key steps in the right adrenal. So you can see the Nathanson's liver retractor already in, and we are dissecting the triangular ligament of the liver to gain access into the uh, adrenal. This is an avascular plane. You are taking the peritoneum slowly out. Because if you don't mobilize the liver adequately, it's very difficult to go into the superior surface of the adrenal lesion.
speed up a little bit. So once you do uh, do the initial dissection, then you can reposition your uh, Nathanson's retractor so that the liver can be further pushed upwards. Now you can see the, the, the lesion is actually here, right? So this is the IVC. You can see the bluish structure there. You can see how close the lesion to the IVC is. So here you have to take your time and do a very gentle dissection. So there's a little bleed from a, uh, one of the tributaries. So if this situation, don't panic. First thing is to take your time, suck. If you can use, put a soap there, apply a little bit of pressure, identify the vein and then flip it. So that's what I told you. We I just set the liver retractor to get further exposure. So now actually what we are doing is we are actually detect, uh, dissecting the medial side of the lesion because you know the uh, you because you are you think the vein will be there and you need to dissect carefully and separate the lesion from the IVC. See we are taking smaller bites. Applying fraction and then sweeping, with sweeping movements, you can just separate those fibers. You stay in the correct plane, you will be safe. And also it will be easier for the dissection. So that's the adrenal vein. You can see how short it is. And how close it is to the IVC relation. So this clip has gone in a diagonal direction. Yeah, of course, the vein is in the, the normal anatomical position. So once you do that, then you will encounter a little bit of oozing from IVC. Apply your soap and apply some pressure. And you can start working from the other, for the, from the other aspect.
speed up a little bit more. Okay, so that's the end of it. Uh, so complications of course, uh, it's common to any laparoscopic surgery, uh, bleeding, if you don't uh, dissect in the correct plane. And other thing is a failure to uh, identify the anatomical structures, uh, especially the adrenal veins and the arteries. So, uh, I mean, with time, uh, uh, once you get experience, you know how to identify them. Uh, bleeding is one of the main reasons for even for conversion as well. Uh, because if you, if you panic and if you cause a lot of bleeding, then the, the, the area becomes bloody and then it's very difficult to identify the structures and it's not safe to dissect them. In that case, most of the time we may have to open up. But generally, if you have enough experience, uh, as you see in this in the, the previous surgery, uh, you can use a blunt grasper and a or soap, apply some pressure, come back with the, uh, the sucker and ready, and then you can uh, most of the time identify the bleeder, and it is a very big bleeder. So uh, the other causes are actually in, uh, in transperitoneal, you can have damage to the other visceral structures like the spleen and then the colon. Uh, so it's really, really important to know the correct uh, tissue planes and dissect meticulously. And also when you're especially using the uh, monopolar hook, be careful uh, not touch the uh, heated hook on, uh, keeping the hook on uh, visceral organs. Uh, so everything has to be done under direct vision. Uh, so with that, I will conclude my uh, presentation and uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if you have. Thank you very much, Udaya and Bhavanta. Uh, very well presented, Udaya. Thank you very much on behalf of the uh, Sri Lanka Association of Minimal Access and Digital Surgeons. Uh, yeah, uh, if there are any questions, please uh, uh, you can uh, post or you can ask directly. Uh, I think. Uh, questions can be posted as well. So please do so, we have some time. Thank you, Professor Bhante. Lakmal, are there any questions posted? Sometimes you may have to uh, uh, Not dissect. Yet, okay. Uh, usually, dissection uh, uh, is possible with uh, ultrasonic dissectors. Uh, sometimes it is uh, easy to dissect, especially. Uh, in the liver region, when you dissect uh, uh, IVC away from the uh, tumor, uh, using the diatomic hook, monopolar hook, so yeah. that you can dissect uh, by a uh, small, uh, you know, you can hook it small layers, and then uh, with the air pressure, the uh, tissue planes are developed. Yeah. Uh, so that is also easy uh, way of dissecting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with Professor Bhavanta because even uh, when I'm dis usually dissecting the left adrenal vein also I use the hook because it can do a very meticulous dissection, a strand by strand. 
uh, taking time right so i think when you are when you are start when you are starting the surgery uh, when you are starting adrenals uh, can actually try uh, uh, hook dissection especially when you are dissecting around the way uh, the veins and the arteries Uh, sir, one question: uh, If yes, you sir. don't have in in right adrenalectomy, if you don't have this proper nethers and uh, like yeah. retractors, yeah. liver retractors, yeah. uh, what else can you use? In actually, our I, actually, I also don't have nethers, so we use a kusheri, and also sometimes if, if that is not also available, you can use another uh, blunt grass for a needle holder. But you must, uh, especially because this will be uh, retracted by your assistant, second assistant, so you need to advise them that. Uh, Uh, be careful with that, but still you can use that. You can use a blunt grasper and lift the liver. Okay, so uh, like a, also uh, like a gold finger, also like a gold finger. You have uh, uh, you have uh, a retractor where from the uh, handle you can rotate and you know the uh, you can make a uh, triangular shape. Triangular uh, shape. Uh, yeah, uh, so that that is also. a uh, useful retractor i can't remember the exact name of the retractor no. uh, for large adrenals so for specimen delivery uh What, so do you use another small incision no sir how do you deliver the yes, specimen uh, i i usually extend a little bit of incision and then uh, and then most of the time we can deliver if you have in the bag or a bag and then uh, so sometimes you extend about another 4 5 cm incision i usually prefer to go from the lateral the lateral port side incision rather than the umbilicus because that's uh, so you can use a muscle splitting technique and go okay thank you sir uh, are there any other questions okay in the absence of any other questions uh, let me thank udaya uh, taking all the trouble uh, preparing this uh, webinar and uh, uh, also i would like to thank all the participants and uh, uh, let me also remind uh, all of you all to join the uh, association of uh, minimal access and digital surgeons of sri lanka applications are available on our website and also uh, uh, you can get the uh, application through uh, trainees forum as well um, we will be conducting annual webinars and also let me take this opportunity to, to ask you to write whatever the your case reports uh, and uh, your uh, interesting cases that you have done uh, write up uh, and submit to us so that we can publish in our uh, newsletter which is also getting published in uh, alsgbi website so this is a good forum for you to uh, publish your work uh, anything else you there to say uh, yes uh... i think you have told almost everything yeah so uh, especially for the juniors uh, uh, those who are who are actually uh, uh, seeing adrenal surgeries so try to learn the learn the principles i mean the, the basic steps uh, 
because you know most of the surgeons in uh, most of the centers actually adrenal is done in only few centers so whenever you have a chance just go and see these things uh, that's one of the advice to the juniors actually and for the uh, the other the junior the, the my colleagues who really want to start we can actually uh, help them with mentoring they really want to start adrenal surgery Okay, thank you very much to there then. In the absence of any other questions, we will conclude the session. Uh, let me thank uh, uh, Chatusha and the uh, staff of the College of Surgeons and uh, uh, Chamil uh, for uh, coordinating this uh, webinar. And uh, our next month uh, in uh, New Year, we will have uh, to, to probably the third week of January, we will have another webinar. We will let you know. Uh, and. Uh, uh, please uh, let the others also who couldn't join today to join with us next month. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night.